you so much today for joining me for our Tech Talk podcast. So, how have you been? It's been a while since we've been on camera or on a podcast together. It has been a while. It's good to talk with you again, Sarah. Um, yeah, it's 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 been a little while, but not too long. We we used to do this quite a bit, and I'm glad we're bringing this program back uh, to life. It's it's always been very helpful for our customers and partners to get these insights into the goings on at Periphery, and I'm I'm glad to be a part of that. Well, I am so glad to um, get to hang out with you and talk about something that's near and dear to both of our hearts, which is um, how you build a media asset library. Um, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your professional background? Of course. So I'm a senior uh, staff development engineer here at Periphery, and I've been working on object storage for coming up on 14 years as part of an overall uh, 30-some year career. So it's almost half of, of, of my career so far has been in, in the area of working on object storage, you know, working with the various APIs that are associated with that and so on, up to and including S3, which you know is near and dear to everybody and quite pervasive in the industry today. So uh, that's where I've been spending most of my time. Uh, a lot of times I'm pulled into situations where people need to have assistance with sizing their solutions or architecting their solutions, getting a feel for how well we map to their use case when it comes to using a periphery uh, solution base. And, uh, that's, that's basically where I live. I, I've been doing that for quite a long time now and I'm getting pretty comfortable with it. I should hope so. Well, I'm really happy to be back in the storage world. Um, and also, you know, really integrated with all of periphery solutions, um, particularly our AI plus portfolio. Um, but yes, we're kind of back to talk about the, the core of, of, um, where we started, um, which is that object-based storage, which enables so many um, functionalities and great things for our media and entertainment and broadcast customers. Um, so what are kind of the use cases that you see that are bringing organizations to periphery archival solutions these days? Sure. Uh, primarily, of course, they're media and entertainment driven. We see a lot of use cases coming in where people want to build a portfolio of content, whether it's images, video, things of that nature, uh, ultimately pull them together, you know, in collations, collections uh, of items that allow them to, to basically publish that at, as a, a content uh, delivery approach. And typically they're doing that with, you know, some of their affiliates, um, they're doing that in syndication, you know, areas like that, or or just live streaming, uh, or they could just be acting as as a back end archive or repo for for a company's, you know, they may have a vast collection of of uh, a library of, of content that they they want to keep archived and protected over a long period of time, you know, that they can draw off of as, as needed and, and surface for various events. For example, you know, a good use, use case or example of that would be, say, uh, something is going on uh, in the United Kingdom, you know, with the royal family. And maybe they want to be able to go back and pull footage from 20 years ago. And, you know, if you think about it, well, that's a pretty that's a simple thing to ask, but it could be a pretty tall order in, in a chain of media assets that you have under your management. You know, going out and being able to locate those needles in a haystack that you think are relevant for for being able to 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 present to an audience, you know, to grab their attention, to 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 get them engaged in the topic at hand, and and those are typically the the, the type of use cases where uh, we get pulled in and and for consideration as, as part of being that solution. Right. I mean, you don't want to have to go find the tape that's been stored in the horse stable with no climate control. <laughs> well, yeah, and that's the thing. Right, it, I mean, the there, people there's have the, left uh, there's the aspect of of finding it quickly, and then there's the aspect of surfacing it quickly and making it available to a large audience quickly. And those are things that you may not be able to do with traditional media management approaches, and and that's where we come in. I mean, when you think about the golden age of studios being like a hundred years ago. You know, we have a shocking amount of audio, video, 
all sorts of assets that companies have built up over the years. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, you know, before they didn't always have a great way to store them. Um, so, you know, a lot of those gems have been lost, but a lot of them, you know, are resurfacing and that's very exciting, um, especially for the person who gets to monetize those. Yes, very much so. Uh, it, you know, digitizing your your media archive is definitely one of those use cases where we come into play. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I know uh, just from prior discussions that you have been involved in a lot of migrations of data where you have been draining stuff off of proprietary systems. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you work around those things when people have that old expensive proprietary hardware where they've been storing things and they're suddenly like, hey, you know, I want to modernize, you know, to the 21st century and I want to use software defined storage so that I never have to go through one of those forklift upgrades and spend that much money at one time again. So how, how do you go about unlocking that data? Sure. You know, you know, the first thing you really want to do is you want to sit down and take inventory. Where where does that data live? What format is it in? What what kind of systems does it reside in? You know, currently, what are your pain points in getting that data into and out of those systems? And, you know, making a decision as to how would I like it to be, right? You know, do I need do I need to shorten my turnaround time on finding things and then publishing it to the world at large? Uh, do I need to do a better job of, of cataloging it? Think things of that nature. You know that that's kind of what you're looking for. What do, what do we have currently in place? Where are all the do all the different silos live and the different formats live? And you know you've dealt with this before. Uh, different codecs that it may be stored under. Things of that nature. What what do we need to do to standardize and modernize all of these media assets that we have currently under our management? Under mm -hmm. they may be old systems or they may be current, but they're proprietary. They may be block based. May, they may be based on network attached storage and, and again get finding all the areas where you have to have all this specialized glue logic and strange workflows and finding a way to collapse that and and basically perform a process of simplification that's that's usually where people start that that's where they try to figure out okay where 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 can we do this process of simplification and drop it all into one place and one of the advantages to our solution is we do do an excellent job of flattening what's necessary from having a piece of content to getting it into the hands of an audience that you want to get it into. You know, some of the traditional uh, publication architectures, you would you would see things where something resides in block storage. Okay, now we have to you know send it up to some kind of application server. Great, now that needs to be routed through some kind of, of, of web farm and ultimately end up on the web browser of somebody who's wanting to uh, to look at that content, right? Swarm, periphery, uh, we do a great job of, of flattening all of that. Your storage basically becomes your publication platform because it's all RESTful API, it's HTTP. So, you know, streaming things from HTTP, that's where we live, that's what we do. And being able to manage it in the same fashion without having to have all these other different storage solutions sitting underneath it that you have to overlay that API on top of, and it may not overlay very well. Being able to move away from that is where the big win is. Yeah, yeah, that and that um, whole concept of an active archive, Right. Yes, it's it's mm -hmm. just um, I think you you said it well in you know it just simplifies your life so much, right. um, especially when you've got something that's self healing, and where um, there are so many um, safeguards built in. So you really have that data protection that you need. Yes. Um. So what are some of the Biggest challenges that you've stored with that you've solved with object storage. So some of the biggest challenges typically come into play where where people have a large amount of unstructured data content, and like I say, it can be various formats. It could be files. It could be, uh, or I'm sorry, it could be pictures. It could be videos. It could be 
completely separate pieces of material that constitute the metadata that are associated with that. Um, you know, you are where skipping people, ahead to our next episode. John yeah, certainly. Ball. And typically that's what happens is you skip right ahead to the whole aspect of, of, of the metadata that's associated with this. And, and a lot of times what people miss is that the metadata is just as important, if perhaps not more important in some situations than the, than the actual, you know, data itself. And you want to be able to standardize a solution around that. So, you don't want to have these different databases with different formats, you know, that aren't built to talk to each other, different namespaces associated with the content that you have under management that you have to figure out some way to glue together in some haphazard fashion. You, you want it, all of that to be seamless. And that that is the big challenge is getting in there and figuring out where those choke points are and figuring out what it's going to take to eliminate those choke points. So, again, you can move towards that simplification of your data management and your publication approach. So, you know, I always think that um, metadata is such an interesting thing. And, uh, you know, from a legal perspective, it can give you you know, if you're fighting piracy and if you're fighting um, copyright protection, um, you know, that those things can be useful, but also, you know, that whole concept of how difficult it can be to find things in storage and metadata really solves for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yes, it does. And, and again, that goes back to the whole concept of taking inventory. And once you've completed this process of moving to our solution and you have that unified namespace of, of access to all the content that is that is under management, it becomes much easier to take stock of what you have in place. It becomes much easier to perform listing and query operations against objects that have been tagged with certain characteristics, especially on ingest, or maybe they haven't been tagged on ingest. And you need to employ a solution like, say, our Periphery AI Plus, which goes in and, and pulls that information and actually inspects it and look, looks for specific characteristics. I think one of the, the examples that we use is we, we don't go so far as to you know look for uh, pictures or videos that have trucks in them. It's good enough to look for. Look for all the pictures and videos that have Ford F-150s in them or, or, or you know, Chevy pickup trucks or Corvettes, you know, or Ferraris or something like that, you know, you know, being able to, to winnow things down to that level of detail and, and not just inspect the metadata, but inspect the actual content and find things that look for that. And then once you found them, turn around and do the necessary metadata updates on that to tag them with those characteristics. So the next time that you come around and you need to pull together a collection like that, you don't have to go through the heavyweight operation of pulling the actual data and inspecting it. Now you just look for the things that have that metadata characteristic, and that becomes much faster. Uh, a great example of that would be something like, say, uh, syndication for, for Shark Week. Right, you, you do that. You do that. You do that initial inspection of all the all all the filming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of, of of all the filming that's been done for 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 Shark Week and and all the different episodes that have been done. And you know, somebody comes to you and says, "Well, I I just want this subset of of episodes for the week for for Shark Week that talks about hammerhead sharks, right?" And it focuses on that. And and you pull up a collection, a pre-made, you know, basically a pre-made query of everything that has the characteristics of hammerhead sharks for those episodes. And you present those episodes. And you, you just publish them straight up and people start streaming them. I think last week was Shark Week for Texas. We had them off the coast of Corpus Christi. Mm -hmm. Right? So John yeah. and I are both in Texas, for those of you who don't know. <laughs> um, so, yes, we... Um, I, I canceled my plan to go to the beach this weekend just between the hurricane storms and the sharks they saw last weekend. I thought it was a bad idea. So we don't have to gather all that shark footage for me. I already know it scares <laughs> me. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I mean, anyway, it's a it's a good example. And and you can do that for is. other things, you know. It is. Things like uh, I, I mean, name something where you would look for, you know, an an image or a pattern, and then tag it with metadata and pull together a collection for it. That that's the whole point behind the whole periphery product suite is the ability to do things like that. Yeah, I, exactly. And the, um, you know, if you're a 
creator or a decision maker, you know, being able to have all of this data at, you know, basically at your fingertips and be able to go find it when you need it is um, a game changer for your business. And, right. and not just media entertainment. It, it can be a life changer. Uh, mm -hmm. One of our the things that we emphasize is our ability to go in uh, to to healthcare use cases and medical imaging and PACs in particular. The same approach would apply. And mm -hmm. if you have an AI engine that has gone through a learning process and it knows what to look for for things like, you know, this is what a broken femur looks like. Or, you know, th this this is what some kind of, of uh, tumor looks like, you know, just as a simple example. And once you know that, oh, th this, is, this is the type of medical image that's associated with this kind of condition, you can start sifting through that data and, you know, maybe looking for patterns. And, you know, th this is something that's that's particularly important to people who are in, say, public health care. And they want they want to get a feel for, wow, we've had a pattern of of this disease or, or these cancers or whatnot. Let's see if we can pull up a collection of everything that's associated with that, because you might tag that with a location, for example. Just I'm, I'm making things up as I go along. But yeah, it, no, absolutely. It's, it's it's a situation where if you expand your imagination on how you can classify data that has been pulled into our solution and then turn around and use the strength of those classifications in other ways to improve people's lives. That's that's where we're coming from with, with our approach. Yeah, and I mean, right now, yes, we're focused on the media and entertainment and broadcasting field, but it is a solution that can scale into many other industries um, and has been used through our parent company, Datacore, and our predecessor company um, for many different use cases. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the most exciting developments while I was gone to the Kodak world for a couple of years um, is, you know, this integration of AI so that we're not just giving people storage, but we're bringing in that additional layer um, so that they can integrate their workflows more smoothly and, you know, we can improve the metadata tagging. And, you know, there's so many positive um, things that can come out of this, you know, mm -hmm. and um, all in, all managed in a very ethical and non-dangerous manner, might I say. Right. <laughs> you know, very true. once again, by people on board who have so much common sense and it's are so intelligent. Um, the AI team has been really fun to work with as well as getting to work with my former colleagues um, and our friends in EMEA who um, produce Object Matrix, which is actually yes. um, an object-based storage that was built for media use cases. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's been, you know, I think it's kind of opened up a whole new world of of opportunities and ways that we can help our customers. Yes, very much so. It, it's been fun watching this evolve over the years. If if you look, for example, at uh, Swarm Storage, you know that that solution in the periphery portfolio. There are AI aspects to it that people may not realize exist. We we often talk about the the bidding algorithms and another health processing management when it comes to to handling the 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 integrity of, of the data that's stored in the system and, and making sure that it um, it doesn't become corrupted over time. A lot of the algorithms that are associated with that are are basically machine intelligence, and that you know the first forays into that, and just you know watching it evolve over time to. To uh, to learning engines and whatnot, and and ultimately to things like Chat GPT with OpenAI and and our own product with Periphery AI Plus, it, it's been quite the journey. Yeah, we I, we've seen so much change in you know just the time that we've known each other, uh, much less our lifetimes. But I'm going to say true. that if if this meeting platform had AI in it, it might have said to me, "Why in the world are you going to have a fireplace in your background?" When it's like 100 degrees in Austin, Texas today. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who know, <laughs> this was taped in the summer in Texas. 
that is a fake background. Um, so yes, yeah, someday, someday the AI will tell me, oh, that's not a good choice for a background today. That's right. Um, so anyway, well, thank you again, John, for joining me today. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I um, hope that we will be having many more podcasts to talk about things in the future. Thanks, Sarah. I enjoy our time together.